Well, you know, listen, we, we love this program and we're back with you again. And uh, just looking forward to uh, our, our, our second uh, time here of uh, sharing with uh, uh, Dr. Roger Blackwell. And uh, boy, what an incredible story he has, written a whole lot of books and uh, this sort of thing and has really just been a true friend to the prisoner, helping them uh, in their plights that they have there. Let me go to a scripture reference and then, then we'll get close to going with uh, Roger in the interview. Uh, in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us turn with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We serve a mighty Savior, <clears throat> and he paid the price so that we could have freedom, my friend, and that we could uh, enjoy going behind the curtain when the veil was rent from top to bottom with a freedom of access into the most holy place to be able to talk to the Heavenly Father. He loves us, cares about us. He created us. He's given us talents and abilities. And he's looking to us uh, to bring forth fruit. That, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. We surrender our lives to the living God, washed in the eternal blood of the Lamb of Calvary. We've done this. We throw our hands up and said, Jesus, I surrender. Thank you for removing my sins and the power of repentance. I turn things loose, the power of release, and then the ability to just be absolutely overrun by the Holy Spirit to lead and guide our lives. Now, we fall short of the glory. I probably got a whole lot more failures than I have success stories, I can tell you. But in the process, each one of them has been a springboard, so to speak, or at least a teaching, everything, uh, to empower and to be uh, where I am today and get to do the things that I do. And so it's a marvelous thing to know the king. I mean, it's just a marvelous thing. We need to surrender to him. We need a lifestyle of obeying him, a lifestyle of evangelism. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. It's what we need. We need to be totally, absolutely sold out, 100%. We need to be owned by him, lock, stock, and barrel. This is the Christian life. It is not the mamby-pamby on a lot of things that we see and some of the things that we hear. Uh, Jesus uh, is our example, and he shows us the way. You can even take a look at uh, Paul, who was known as Saul, but later Paul the Apostle. Look at his life. Study his life. Look what he went through. But yet he remained faithful to the very end. He was always pressing forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. It never went away from him all the way into the prisons that he was in, all the way to Rome. He was captivated by Jesus. And he even uses the words, I am a prisoner of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, this, God owns us, folks. Uh, this, this is, we need to be saturated in his word. We need to be rolling forward for the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's just what I'm saying to you. And uh, I, I just give God the glory and, the, and, and all of the credit for it. And... Uh, well, I'd like to get over here to Dr. Roger, and we'll swing over here to, to meet him. Boy, I tell you what, uh, you've, uh, you've just had a wonderful, incredible, impressionable life from the Lord. Ups and downs, but he's controlled you, and he's led you, uh, oh my gosh, to write so many books, help so many people, and uh, you know, that's success. Success is we are servants of the Most High God, and as servants... We are apt to make other people successful. That's what we do to help them and train them to get through these life trials and all. Let's, uh, let's share a little bit. Uh, you, uh, you talk about the, uh, boy, this is a, this is a great question. It, uh, uh, the life about a life of success of diligence and work skills. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I grew up on a farm. 
and uh, <clears throat> child labor laws don't apply to farm kids. <laughs> the only people who don't work on a farm are <laughs> people who don't want to eat. <laughs> uh, and my parents uh, started working. I worked when I was very young at uh, uh, harvesting bluegrass oh my. Uh, in a little farm in Missouri. Yeah. And later, uh, we moved to the town, big town, a huge city of about 6,000 people. <laughs> um, and my mother said, would you like a job? And I said, oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and she helped me start a little business oh my. of selling greeting cards from door to door. Hmm. Um, and I covered that whole town with my wow. bicycle. The time I was 12, I was making almost as much as my father. Oh, wow. My father was poor. And then I, uh, I actually, as one of my best greeting card customers was the owner of the local bank. <laughs> and so when I was 16, I walked in and I said, Mr. Robinson, um, I'd like to borrow $4,000. And he said, what? I said, well, I want to buy a house with it. He said, Roger, is something wrong at home? Are you thinking about leaving or something? I said, oh, no, no, no. I want to buy it and rent it. And I did. Oh. I, I had $1,000. He loaned me the $4,000. Oh, the my bank God. Wow. As a teenager. Yeah. Well, all through life, I learned how to be prosperous from my parents. Later, I learned from my professors. And yeah. then I had 65,000 students at Ohio State University over yeah. the years, over a 40-year career of teaching there. Uh -huh. And so what I learned, I put in this new book, uh, You Are Not Alone. Yes. And what I learned is all through life, starting with my life, uh, I was born dead. Um, and my parents were extremely poor. And my dad was making $40 a month. Um, and he had saved $20 for a home delivery. Because back then, if you didn't have the money, you couldn't go to the hospital. Oh, yeah. You know, it just, that's the way it was. And so the doctor came out to the little farmhouse where my parents lived and to deliver me for the $20, and I didn't come out. Oh, my. Uh, and he took forceps and pulled and stretched. My head apparently was all cut up and kind of actually stretched. Mm. And finally, the doctor said, my, I, my dad has told the story many times, and I've heard it. And he, the doctor threw the forceps on the floor and said, if we don't get this woman to the hospital, she'll die. Wow. And there was only one hospital in that county about 20 miles away. They put me in, uh, they put her in an ambulance. I got there, and when I got to the hospital, they did a C-section and took me out by C-section, and I was stillborn. Oh. So they laid me up on a shelf for 45 minutes with no oxygen. Uh. My father and my grandmother were in that operating room, a little tiny hospital. Your studio is probably larger than that hospital. And anyway, uh, I finally took a breath, and my dad thought he saw a movement, and then my grandmother started ra raising oh, my level of yeah. oxygen, apparently. And so after that, the doctor told my father, that was a mistake. He'll be so brain damaged going that long without oxygen, you should have never done that. And so mm -hmm. when I heard my dad, father tell this story, he always ended in saying, so I wondered, his mother and I wondered how he would have turned out if he hadn't been brain damaged. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way this starts, because yeah. a lot of people said you were alone in there with the doctor and the nurse and your father and grandmother. But I wasn't alone. Wow. Someone else was in that room. I think God had a plan for me. And when I say someone else, I capitalize the S on someone. Boy, that, that, that is just absolutely phenomenal. What a story. And it's in the book. And uh, so it is. Uh, you, you continue on. Let's, I, w I would like to learn a little bit more about uh, uh, your life and, and uh, how you, matter of fact, we, uh, how you ended up uh, in prison and some of the stories evolving around that. Sure. I uh, was a, a teacher in the business school. I also taught in the medical school, but mostly in the business school. And as a result of a lot of books that I wrote, uh, one of my books sold over a million copies in a dozen languages all over the world. Wow. I was asked to go on boards of directors. And I went on a healthy foods board, seven-day Adventist board, actually, uh, called Worthington Foods. And once we were discussing possible sale to Kellogg. Now, in that time, people, 6,000 
people bought the stock because the stock fell. This was 1999 mm -hmm. when tech stocks were going through the ceiling and bricks and mortar health food companies were not. And so the stock price dropped and one of the persons who managed my office bought stock with her husband and she uh, and he had been buying it for five years and they just bought more. Mm. But the prosecutors argued, well, if she had worked for him for five years and was one of his students, told the jurors, wouldn't you have told her? And she testified, no, he didn't. So she went to prison for 27 months, her husband 24 months, and I went to prison for 72 months. Um, oh, wow. Sometimes we get hit on the side or in the back. We and, do. You we know, do. and don't. But I'm sure there were a lot of lessons learned where you went. There was. Uh, Nelson Mandela said, no one really understands a nation until you've spent time in its prisons. And, and he's right. And I, I taught GED courses for six years in mm. prison. And they taught me how much of the rest of the world lives. And, oh, yeah. Uh, why some people escape from the hood and others don't. Mm. Um, I did over 100 focus group interviews with drug dealers. So if you, if you need to know about how the supply chain works for drugs, let me know because I, <laughs> I learned. You know how that from, work and operates. From the experts, yeah. Uh, one of the guys in the bunk next in the cell next to me uh, used to dig tunnels underneath the, the fences to bring the drugs. Wow. And he took little rails and lights and all kinds of stuff. And I learned stuff that you wouldn't learn at the... Uh, halls of a major university. Well, I can understand that. I can see that, too. So uh, there's no question that uh, maybe you can give us, uh, you know, sometimes I, I've heard my buddy John Simone tell stories about being in prison. Do you have a, you have a, like a little quick story, 60-second story you can give us that, that something happened to you in there that really electrified your life and touched your life? Well, I think one of the things that illustrates that you are not alone, which is the theme of this book, was two days after I went in. Now, I had been in a Bible study for years at my local church, uh, Upper Arlington Lutheran Church, and that Bible study, we rotated teaching. So the, we all taught. And on a Tuesday morning, second day I was in prison, the guys in my Bible study from seven to eight that morning prayed that my teaching skills would be used while I was in prison. Yeah. Now, everybody works in prison, and a lot of people don't know this. If you have any images of people sitting around doing nothing in prison, that's not the way it works. Everybody has a job. If the, yeah. if the water breaks at 2 o'clock on a cold morning, the guards wake up the prison, the inmate who has the, the prison emergency plumber and wakes him up. Well, I would have probably had, for the first two or three years of my sentence, morning a.m. food service, which oh, is gosh. in the morning, oh. cooking and scrubbing and all that kind of stuff. Well, the literacy director sent a letter, a message by another inmate. You don't have cell phones in prisons, of course, and uh, to come to her education building. And she said, some of the inmates told me you're an author, that you write books. Is that true? I said, yeah. She didn't know I was a teacher. Right. And she said, well, we have trouble getting someone to teach grammar to our GED courses. Mm. That's a tough one. I said, could you do that? I said, well, I've never done that, but I probably could. She said, be here at 7.30 in the morning, and I'll watch you teach. Well, she hired me. So three days after I got there, I got a job as teaching, which I did for six years. <laughs> now, other people, wasn't, was it just a coincidence yeah. that those men in my Bible study prayed, and one hour later, the, t the uh, instructor in the prison sent this note to me? Yeah. That's the kind of things that convinced me. God goes with you yeah. if we are willing to go with him. That, you know, that's just, that's an incredible story. We're going to break for music. That, that is one of those supernatural stories you just gave. We're going to go just with, like uh, yeah, we're going to go with Jonathan Vaughn, uh, It Was Me. Maybe you're wondering why Jesus did all that he has done. Why did he leave? through all that pain. Here's why. I heard about a man named Jesus who left his home up above to come to this world below, spreading hope, peace, and love. I wondered why he came so far from where he grew up. Then I heard a preacher say, 
just for me. It was me, it was me, Jesus came to rescue me. He turned my night into day, washed all my sins away. It was has done, how he turned my world around, gave me life when there was none. Maybe you're wondering if he loves you the same. I hope you realize he does. all my sins away. Thank you so much. Boy, I'm, I'm intrigued with uh, uh, Dr. Roger Blackwell. Let's get right to it. I want to ask you a question here that uh, you say God spared your life while you was uh, in, in uh, prison. And maybe you can, uh, what, what is it? Uh, how did he spare your life while you were there? Oh, well, um, in the prison I was at, which was a federal prison in West Virginia, there were 1,400 men in there. And there was... Uh, all kinds of things. Majority there for drug-related offenses, but there were MBAs and JDs, uh, several attorneys and several doctors, a few doctors, and uh, all kinds of other people. But almost everybody was there. 60% uh, of my GED students were black, 30% Latino, and a few old white guys who sold white lightning in the hills. Uh, but basically, 1,400 men. Mm. And one day I was close to getting out. And I was jogging, and I came in, and I knew something was really wrong, and I collapsed right in front of one of the other inmates named Eric. Eric was the only inmate in that prison who was formerly an emergency room doctor. He took my pulse. It was 240. Now, the medical center closed at 7 p.m., and this was about 10 minutes before that. He actually gathered me up in his arms and carried me to it because he got to get me there before it closed. And as he, as we were getting close, maybe 100 yards from it, he saw the nurse, the only person working there, was leaving, locking up. He laid me on a bench, ran to get the nurse. And he came over, the nurse did, and saw I was in desperate trouble. And they gave me some emergency aid and called a squad, took me to West Virginia University Hospital, and I, I survived. Obviously. Wow. Now, what's the probability mm -hmm. that I would collapse in front of the only emergency room doctor who was an inmate in the prison? Mm -hmm. And that's happened. And actually, the theme of the book is you're not alone. Uh, and, and actually, I learned that because I was an atheist, uh, and I learned that probabilities are from Bay, a guy by the name of Reverend Bayes, a Presbyterian minister. And, and I talk about how it takes too much faith to be an atheist. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you look at the probabilities of the Earth creating itself, it's one to the minus 67th power. That means point 67 zeros one. 
Well, those are not very good odds. <laughs> That's Pascal's wager. And and I learned that, and, and this book is really a case ex, case uh, analysis like yeah. you'd use in business school to analyze faith. And I hope it'll be encouraging to people who may feel uh, despondent and uh, alone and isolated, sometimes on a ventilator today, uh, uh, with nobody else around. That's, I think it'll, the book will encourage those people. But the last chapter includes the prayer and an invitation to become a Christian. Yeah. And I've already had some people tell me they gave it. One person said they gave it to their adult daughter, hoping she would become a Christian because of the book. Oh, yeah. That, that's that's great. As well. Well, that's great. So uh, with all of that, you got to be thinking about uh, people who make their failures at some things or a lot of things. Or they made some mistakes, like we all do. But yep. but how do we how do we help them uh, recover from from the mistakes and and uh, the things that they've fallen so short of? Well, it's the Holy Spirit that okay. does it. I, I have seen a lot of ministries, and I've seen a lot of rehab programs that were not ministries, and it's the ministries that are almost always the successful ones. I see. The, the ability for non-Christian ministries or uh, rehab programs to work is very low. Mm. I'm not saying they don't ever, but it's the Holy Spirit. And getting the Holy Spirit into your life is the key. And it took me a while, a lot of years, actually, to learn to do that. And I, over the years, formed 10 rules, which are ten part rules. of this yeah. 10 rules. Um, one of those rules is help as many people as you can in as many ways as you can for as long as you can. That's great. And actually, I borrowed that. Uh, maybe you've read John Wesley's little wisdom yeah. book. And that, that's what Wesley said. And, and he was right. And so I put those in there. And uh, if your viewers, you know, don't want to get the book, they're also on my website. I see. Uh, those ten rules under the about tab of my website, but the book really ends with these uh, ten rules that have guided me through life. Some pretty interesting experiences, yeah. uh, and financial success and all this. I was very successful, and living in a nice home in a really good bed, one year, and the next year I'm stealing, sleeping on a steel plate. Oh. They call it, and with mm. a little cotton pad that they call a mattress and to go from that and and I understood but when I went there I understood that when I got out of college out of Northwestern I I kind of thought I should be a missionary in Africa <laughs> but I was just starting my academic career and you really can't postpone that so I said I'm sorry God I, I can't do that and then he sent me to a prison in West Virginia and I think he said okay evangelism you didn't do it 40 years ago, so have at it now. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I was fortunate that uh, I didn't know Spanish very well. Oh. And my, uh, I, I just knew a few words, actually. And this instructor who uh, supervised the tutors who actually teach GED courses, she said, I see you using a few words of Spanish. Can, can you teach a, a section in Spanish? Because you're allowed to take the GED in Spanish. Hmm. And I said, oh, no, I don't know that. But so I took two courses in Spanish taught by other inmates enough to teach one section. Oh my goodness. And in that section, most of them weren't Christians, but I, I had a friend who sent a, what might be called the Four Spiritual Laws or uh, right. May I Share yeah. the Bridge. He sent that to me in Spanish. And every one of those guys in my class accepted the Lord. Oh, Lord. In that class. Whoa. It was, you know, it was, it was great. And, and the, uh, they wanted to have a fiesta to celebrate, <laughs> yeah. except we couldn't have a baptism in the class, but we could have a fiesta. And and I went to the teacher, the oh, instructor, no. supervised this, the staff member, and she because it was strictly against the rules to have food or beverage in the classroom. Yeah. And she gave us permission on a Friday afternoon, and we had tacos. And, uh, and we had a fiesta to celebrate accepting Christ. Yeah, and, wow. And those were the kind. Of, those were the oh, the good things. In fact, with Christmas just out of the way. Some people might be interested. There is a, there, one of the most desolate times in prison is Christmas yeah. or any holidays because you want to be with family. My first Christmas, 
I was sitting in the quiet room all by myself, thinking about Christmas's past and so forth. And a couple guys knocked on the door and said, hey, Blackwell, we got a guy who wants to become a Christian, but we don't know how to do that. Will you tell him? So he comes in and I lead this guy to the Lord that I didn't even know. You know, oh, okay. usually you have pre-evangelism and it takes time and all. What a gift oh. God gave me. Oh. Saying, I want to become a Christian. Can you tell me how? Oh, that is phenomenal. Oh, my goodness gracious. So that uh, made a better Christ, a Christmas than I otherwise would have had. Yeah, well, boy, I tell you what, those are some uh, most incredible stories. And I'm going to just be leaving that people got about two more minutes. And I'd like to, you know, stir your heart into the now, you know, uh, now, how, how, what are you doing now uh, that we can kind of jump on that thing and be a part of what you're doing? Well, as I say in the book, I was not allowed to go back to the university and teach um, because they didn't, the dean said she didn't want a felon in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, but Wheaton College invited me, and I taught there and some other places too. Mm. And I started teaching business seminars. And today I teach people how to start a business Absolutely. because I taught actually in prison a course on how to get a job when you get out. And there were other business people there, and we all taught that course. And a lot of them would say, well, Blackwell, nobody's going to hire me. I got a felony conviction. And I'd say, well, that's probably true. Uh, so why don't you hire yourself? They said, what do you mean by that? I said, start your own business. I mean, if you can mow lawns, you can make $100,000 a year yeah. if you have your own business or paint houses or all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. And so I started this book on how to do that. Well, now I, I wrote a, a book, which is also by Union Hill, the same publisher as, as the new one. Uh, on how to start and grow businesses. And I, I give lectures all over the country, most of them by Zoom or Skype today, but right. uh, some, of them, some of them in person. I was in Savannah, Georgia, and I'm scheduled to be on Alabama in May. We'll see, I hope that's yeah. uh, in person by then. Um, but uh, that's what I do now, and uh, uh, have a really good church that I go to. And, that's and, awesome. Uh, that's just absolutely. I, uh, story about how I found a wife and I had been married before sometimes God saves the best for last I found he out he does we're, uh, we're, we're just asking God to bless you we're asking the Lord to take you to the nth degree uh, to what he has the plan and purpose for your life because I can tell he's got his hand on you we thank you so much for being a part of the program and hope we can do it again sometime uh, you're a very you. interesting man uh, to listen to God bless you